let's turn our Bibles very quickly to Genesis chapter 26. Genesis chapter 26. Welcoming everyone joining us online. Thank you for tuning into this broadcast today. Genesis chapter 26. I'll read in verse 1. You come in in verse 2 until we get to verse 6. And we jump to 12, 13, and 14. I read verse 1. And there was a famine in the land beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, unto Gerah. Verse 2, everybody. And the Lord appeared unto him. Go not down. Uh-huh. Verse 3. So John in this land, and I will be with you. And will bless you for unto you and to your seed. I will give all these countries. And I will perform the oath which I swore, swear unto Abraham thy father. Verse to everybody. I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of the heaven. And I will give unto thy seed all these countries. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Verse 5, because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandment, my status, and my law. Verse 6, everyone. Please, can we look at someone here? Can we look at something here? Verse 3, can we look at verse 3? The first four words in verse 3. Can they show us verse 3? First four words, can we all read it together? One, two, go. Can we look at verse 6? Can we read it together after the count of two? One, two, go. So John here and the man dwelt there. Can you catch something there? What happened there? We see what? Say it again. Obedience. Verse 12. Let's look at that verse 12. One, two, go everybody. Then Isaac sowed in that land and received in the same year an hundredfold and the Lord blessed him. Verse 13 everybody do it together and the man was great went forward grew until he became very great. Verse 14 let's look at what it means. Verse 14 want to go for he had possession of flocks possession of herds, great store of servants, and the Philistines envied him. All of that because of what? And that's why today I want to speak to you on one of the covenant secrets for extraordinary kingdom prosperity. And that is obedience. Stand to your feet, remain standing, just place your hand upon yourself. If you're sitting, stand up please. And let's pray together. Ask God for the grace for obedience in 2023. Total obedience. Just ask God for that grace. That Lord, when you say, stay here, I will stay. When you say, move, I will move. When you say, start, I will start. When you say, stop, I will stop. Ask God for grace. Such grace is upon your life in Jesus' name. Can I have a good amen in the house of God? Amen. God bless you. Please, you may be seated in the presence of God. God wants to prosper you. God wants to prosper you. Number two, God is pleased when you prosper. Young person, whatever it is you do, God wants to prosper you. And God is pleased when you prosper. God is not upset when you prosper. Your prosperity pleasures God. Your prosperity pleasures God. We have already seen all of that in scripture. Number three. We've also been able to see how that God has made provisions for your prosperity. God has made provisions for your prosperity. Let me make a statement that perhaps may help you. 
Only a stingy person will not truly want to be prosperous. And even stingy individuals still want to prosper. But for themselves. Anyone who cares about others. Anyone who genuinely cares about others. Will desire to prosper. There's a limit to what you can do in the lives of people by just advising them. When somebody comes to you talking about their house rent, your encouragement is fantastic, but paying for it will go a longer way. A better, it will be a better thing. So it's important to know that prosperity is not about self. It's about others. It's about God putting you in a position where you can be of help to so many people. It's, it's about God putting you in a place whereby you can walk to communities and, 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 and build schools for them, renovate their schools, renovate their hospitals, provide beds for them. If you go to some villages in our country, You'll be amazed to know that there are no beds. Am I even talking about villages? How about even some of our hospitals in the city? General hospitals that have no beds. And women have to lay on the floor to give birth. So after they give birth, they have to put mattresses on the floor for them. We can make a difference. We can change lives. We have a young girl in the University of Abuja. I think she's almost done now. And I think once she entered into the university first year, she had a problem with being sponsored. Her parents could no longer afford that. And somehow she reached out. And we just, in a little way, we didn't even know. Some this month we just... This semester, we, just, we didn't even know how we're just doing it. And then finally, she called me and said, Daddy, I'm in my final year. I said, when did we start with you? And you do a final year. And guess what, sir? In first class. First class. How many young people do we have who have the potential to become first class students but may never see the four walls of the university because there's nobody to fund them? This is why God has to prosper you as a doctor, as a cryptocurrency guy, as an investor. This is why you have to aspire for something great. This is the purpose of prosperity. Changing lives. This is the purpose of prosperity. Transforming communities. Bringing the awareness of Jesus to people who don't want to hear the preaching. But they will love it if they can see the good works. God wants to prosper you for the sake of widows. God wants to prosper you because of orphans. They will never see God. But if they see you, you reveal God to them. It's not about another Rolex wristwatch or another Valentino bag and, and Gucci belts. It's, it's not about all of that. How many of them will you have? It's about making a difference in the lives of people. So the word prosperity actually as much as they say so some churches are prosperity preachers and all of that. Listen to me. It's because you don't understand what prosperity is all about. Prosperity is not just about money. It includes but it's not exclusive just to that alone. I started in the first service by telling them that the word prosperity is the Hebrew word salak. T-S-A-L-A-C-H. That is the word prosperity. And it means to advance. That if you have a first degree, you should do what? Advance to a second degree. Have your masters. Go on for your PhD. If you move on like that, you are prospering. 
that you make up your mind and say, listen, by the grace of God, I, I want to come down from size. I, I want to come down from 180 kg, 160 kg. I want to come down to say 90 or 100 and all of that. And if you're able to achieve that and you become healthier, that is prosperity. Prosperity is about advancement. It's about progress. Everything about prosperity is against stagnation. So one of the proofs you are not prospering is that you are stagnating. So God wants you to go against the tide of stagnation and wants you to begin to prosper. Somebody say I will prosper. No, you're not saying like somebody that's committed to say I will prosper. Again, when you hear the word prosper, or whenever you say to yourself, I will prosper, you are saying, I will advance. You're also saying, I will progress. You're also saying, I will flourish. Somebody say flourish. So to prosper means to flourish. It means to thrive. It means also to grow strong and become vigorous. It means to possess enough. To be able to pursue your God-given dream and also help others to achieve their dreams. How many of you want, how many of us want that kind of prosperity here? Fantastic. So because God wants us to prosper like this, he has made available means by which we can prosper. He has made available covenant principles that will enable us to prosper. And one of those covenant principles, which if you practice will guarantee your prosperity, is what we call obedience. Obedience. Okay, yes. I know we're in the era of obedience. <laughs> I just know that obedience are obedience, you know. Obedience, obedience. <laughs> Praise God. So what we are talking about here is obedience to divine instruction. Write that down. Obedience to divine instruction. And I want to state it again so clear. The only thing God requires from you is obedience. The only thing God requires from you is obedience. Every test you go through it's about obedience. Every instruction God gives you is about obedience. Abraham, take your only son, take him to a mountain. How can you tell me to take my only son to a mountain and, and, and kill that boy? Question, does God eat human beings? So offering Isaac was that providing food to God. So it's obvious that it's not the killing of Isaac that was God's concern. It was the test of obedience in a man that God has already prospered. God wants to check, will this guy still be obedient as he was when I told him to leave his father's house? At that time, he had so little. Now I bless him so much. Can I tell him to give me something of value? Will he obey? Here is something you must write. At every level God brings you to, you will face a new test of obedience. Please write that down. That's very powerful. Somebody will understand it very soon. At every level you come to, God is going to give you a new level of obedience. For me, at a point, it was forget about practicing. I want you to go and serve me. So I thought that was it all. So I left practicing as to practice as a geologist and decided to answer the call of God. And then started a church in Lagos. And the next thing the Lord said to me, leave the church and go to Abuja. How can you start a church? And then someone will tell you, leave the church and don't look back. Don't collect a dime, hand over the church, walk away from the church. First, you told me to walk away from my career. Second, to start a church. I started the church and you said, walk away. And I walked away from the church. 
come to Abuja. I came to Abuja. And on getting here, it turns out I don't know anybody. And you told me to start a church here. And then we started a church. And don't go to anybody. Don't ask for money. And then we started. And move here. Move there. And then we got over to this place. And the next thing now, back off. Let somebody else be the executive pastor. Hand over the other branch to somebody else. It's all a journey in obedience. And can I say this? As we obeyed God. And say, okay, look, let somebody handle this. He grows it. There's something about your life. At every stage you attain, God will subject you to a new test of obedience. How would you feel that God told you to leave your father's house? You left. And finally, you trusted God for a child. The child came and now you are sitting to enjoy the child. You started a church and you are enjoying the church. And now like investors normally think. And those with investment mentality in the church. You now sit down and say praise God. Ah, It's now time for us to eat the fruit of our labor. Like church is labor. Uh, fruit. <laughs> you now want to sit down. Let's eat. And then God says again my son. Give it up. Isaac that had spent years to, to nurture. Joseph was said Isaac was about 30 years old at that time. How dare you say I should kill something that I, I spent years to wait for and then I spent extra years to nurture. Listen to me. God will test you again. God is going to test you again. But every time God tests you in the area of obedience, he's got, always take your eyes away from what God is talking about. Keep your eyes on something bigger to come. Please, I'd like you to always remember that. That's the trick in this journey. If God is asking it from me, if God is speaking to me to start, to stop, to continue something, then God has something bigger in mind obedience is what will reveal what God has in mind. Did you hear what I just said? Write that down. Obedience, full obedience is what will reveal what God has in mind. Obedience is what will reveal what God has in mind. Everything about our relationship with God is a test of obedience. All these things we are quarreling over uh, tithe, uh, first fruit. Wait a minute. Let me ask you a question. If God says to me, my son, I want the first of your income to be given to me. Pastor, wait a minute. They want to use it to pay staff in heaven? I mean, like they've run short of money in heaven, so they want to pay staff? How can you tell me to give me something you don't need? Have you thought about the fact that everything God is asking you to give him, he doesn't need them? God needs your tithe. He doesn't need it. What does God need from you? Say it again. See, see, see the point is God wants to see whether that thing is superior in your heart to him. I ask a question this morning. If, you, if you're hanging out, you're shacking with a man. I mean, for instance, as a lady, if for instance you came to church from a man came to drop you here. I'm not saying it happens here. It doesn't happen at all, you know. But in case, like, you know, so in case a man dropped you here and you slept in his side Friday, you normally go there Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I'm not speaking by word of knowledge. I'm only saying in case it happens. So, <laughs> so let's assume that you go to this man's place and you stay Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. It's a married man. Or maybe not even married, but you just go around and, and, and hang out with him. And the man brings you to church. And in a service like this, as I just made that illustration now. And you're like, God, does he, know, does he know I'm here? I know. God knows you are here. Is that okay? 
So actually God is sending me to you. Now don't take this moment for granted. If God says never return there again, call that man and cut it off. Listen to me. God, is God interested in marrying the man? If God tells you to keep your body holy, does God want to use your body? Does he need your body in heaven? No. So any instruction God is giving to you, it's for your profiting. Always keep it in mind. Hey brother, don't drink, don't drink, don't drink, don't drink 17%. No. Let me ask your brother, someone around you, say like, how many percent do you take? Cutting is in percentage now. There are those who take full percent. There are those who take 70. Then there are those who take 15. And when you are coming to church, It's so bold like you are drunk with the spirit. No. <laughs> As I'm talking, I can see the bottle of wine. Oh, you, 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 have, you, even, you even have a wine bar. Child of God. Child of God. You have wine bar. 17%. 40. Then there's full one. You have wine bar. Alcoholic drinks. I can see cigar. Cigar. You. Cigar. Uh, vape. Is that vape? Is that what they Ma? Loud. Loud. <laughs> I don't know that one. You can see that I'm in the Old Testament. Which is the one they do that they'll be that that's pipe? She sh you know it. <laughs> yeah, you know it. Okay, so so here's again. When God begins to say to you, my daughter, walk away from Shisha, walk away from loud. <laughs> Because they need it in heaven, your smoking it is reducing its availability in heaven. No, talk to me. When God says, don't do that, they need it in heaven? No. There's something bigger. You're losing your life by enjoying this. When God talks about celibacy, when God says keep yourself clean, when God says stay away from sexual immorality, ha, huh, Pastor, does he know it's you? I wonder who says it's he? Who says it's he? You know it's he. But the God who says stay away from it, that God has seen Samson, your uncle, he saw what happened to your uncle Samson. He saw it. He saw how that the children of Israel are not enjoying their lives today because of your uncle Abraham. He has seen how this thing has messed up many people's lives. But you know, the problem is that in every generation, there's always somebody who thinks, me, I know how to play my game. Until finally when you find yourself in a mess, then you know that you are not as smart as the ancient of days. Unfortunately, for so many of us, by that time, sir, the egg has fallen. The shells are broken. You can't put life back together. God will have mercy on you, but the shells may never be together again. The wounds will be there. For someone who, unfortunately, please, I'm not saying this to hurt you, but for someone who has, by virtue of some loose lifestyle, you've damaged the womb, or for some reasons you've damaged your seminal vesicles, God will forgive you, and truly God could heal you, can heal you, but the chances are that you may not be, your womb may not be restored. Why play
play games with our lives when obedience will make us live in a safe zone. There's something about it, obedience. It minimizes unpleasant experiences. Write that down. Obedience to God's instruction minimizes unpleasant experiences. It does what, sir? It minimizes what, sir? Unpleasant experiences. Ah! Hmm. So obedience to divine instruction is the only thing God will ever ask, ever require from you. Every instruction you receive from God is designed to test your obedience level before advancing you. So promotion always lies on the other side of obedience. Write that down. Promotion, prosperity, favor, increase, you have no idea what your life will have become if you had obeyed. Uh, 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 uh. Look up. You have no idea what your life would have become if only you had done, done what? Obeyed God. You have no idea what you missed when you chose not to obey God. <laughs> only eternity will show you what your life would have looked like if on that day when God says start, you started, and God says stop, you stop. If only you had done that, you will never see wine. You will never see new wine if you don't obey by pouring water into the water pots. The blessing of obedience is always on the other side of obedience. Launch out into the deep. You will never see a next breaking miracle until you launch out into the deep. The blessing is always on the other side of what, sir? Obedience. See, this whole Christianity coming to church on Sunday, the moment you remove obedience from your coming to church is a wasted religion. What makes Christianity enjoyable, sir? It's obedience. It's what, sir? Obedience. I mentioned today that God will not advance you beyond your point of last disobedience. Ah? Huh? God will not do what, sir? Is that Oga Philemon? Good to see you. <laughs> I'm seeing so many nice faces here today. Praise God. God will not advance you beyond your point of last disobedience. So what some people are praying about, Father, I command this obstacle to move. The obstacle is your disobedience. And every time you are praying for new things, God will say, how about what I told you to do? Can we go back there? And start there. What did I tell you 2022? What did I tell you in March? What did I tell you in April? Can we revisit it? Having a readiness to deal with all disobedience when your obedience is complete. Obedience has to be what, sir? Complete. You want to enjoy great grace? Walk in obedience. Why should we walk in obedience and total obedience for that matter? It is a key to breakthroughs. Obedience is a key to breakthroughs. John chapter 2 verse 5. Amplified version. Whatever he says to you, do it. Whatever he says to you, what? Please let me look at your neighbor. Say this year, whatever he says, just do it. Come on, let me talk to somebody. Say whatever he tells you this year. Just do it. If it tells you to start, start. If it tells you to stop, stop. Just whatever he tells you to do this year, do it. Write the song and, and create the picture, design the stuff and fast in the morning and pray in the afternoon and wake up all night and whatever he tells you to do, just what? 
That is how to attract extraordinary grace in 2023. Why should we obey him? It is a proof of our love for him. It is the proof. Write that down. Why should we obey him? I'm going to ask you next week. This year you will write. And so this one, I'll preach, preach. Just be right on, Pastor. There's no right on anywhere. We are riding together this year. <laughs> are you happy you are taking notes? Fantastic. Well, there's no right on anywhere. You're right. It's right on, not right on. <laughs> Praise God. You're right on. So let me say the first thing I said is that one of the major blessings that comes with obedience is that it brings what? Let me hear you. It brings what? It brings breakthrough. It is the key to strange breakthroughs. Why did we say that? In John chapter 2 verse 5, the mother said, whatever he said, I know this man. I know the way he works. Whatever he tells you to do, just do it. And when they did it, they had a breakthrough. They had a miracle. The Bible calls it the first public miracle of Jesus Christ. Where water became wine. Anything can become anything if obedience is in place. Water can become wine if your obedience can be in place. I'm telling you again. Water can become wine if your obedience can be in place. God can turn water of no value, so to say, to wine of great value. If your obedience can be in place, you and I know that there is not a problem with our God. There is a problem with our obedience. And when we talk about obedience, I'm not talking about partial or inconsistent obedience. I'm obedience, I'm talking about consistent and total obedience. I'm, I'm not talking about not sleeping with women but sleeping with pornography. No. No. Total obedience. I don't like coming to church. Father, there are other messages I could preach. Why am I preaching this one now? Help me look at someone and tell the person, this will be your week of sunshine. Tell the person, I believe you can fly. <laughs> but you need some obedience to fly. <laughs> Praise God. One of the second reasons why obedience is needed is that it is a proof of your love, your love for him. In John chapter 14, in verse 15, if you love me, keep my command. So can you see where obedience matter goes to? Oh, I love you, Lord, and I live to share you all my okay so 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 I love you Lord is a song is that okay the proof of it is in what because he said if you love me the proof is that you will keep my commandments so for those of you that think we have escaped the era of commandments no Jesus said, this time around, the proof that you love me is always going to be measured by your consistent commitment to keeping my commandments. So here's what Jesus is saying. Don't tell me you love me. Just obey my commandments. Does that make sense now? Don't talk about, Lord, I love you. I love you, Lord. And I, I lay down on the floor. Jesus, you know how I love you. No, 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 no. Just show me the commandments you obey. And please, we're not talking about old commandments. We're talking about the New Testament commandments. God wants to prosper you, but it is contingent on obedience. Your eminence is tied to your obedience. Your prominence is tied to your obedience. In fact, somebody once said your preeminence is tied to your superior obedience. Obedience. 
Obedience is the doorway to enjoying a graced and blessed life. Obedience is the doorway to enjoying a graced and a blessed life. Thank you, Jesus. Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 1 to 3. I want everybody to look at it. Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 1 to 3. It shall come to pass. If thou shalt hearken diligently. Unto the voice of the Lord thy God. To observe and to do. Somebody say observe and to do. Yes. So observe and to do. How many? I'm not hearing everybody in church. And how many of it are you supposed to do? All. Is that okay? And this is how Jesus put it. Say, all the commandments. All the commandments. It's in this word. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. Thou shalt love the Lord. You get that? So everything in the commandment. So those of you that thought you have escaped all the commandments. Jesus said all the commandments is nestled in this simple statement. So you have not escaped anything. It's only that it has been now been compressed into one statement. And Jesus puts it this way. He said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God. And how do you love the Lord? By obeying his commandment. Are you back to where, what you thought you ran away from? So the grace teaching that escapes, eludes you or excuses you from obeying God's command. In the New Testament, that grace teaching is a false teaching. As I begin to tidy up, think about this. Isaac was about to move. Isaac was about to leave the city. When, because of there was famine, because there was famine, economic hardship, things were not working fine. He was in a country where things were not working fine. There, was, there were hearts men. Hearts men were going to the villages and things were not going on well. You know, um, so some things happened at Lucky Gate. So, and they were not hearing from the leadership. So there were a lot of problems. And so, so many people began to jackpot in that country. So lots of people just began to jackpot like that. A lot of people. And everybody was moving to where there was, there was mass migration to where? Canada to where? Ah, huh? The UK, just anywhere. If, if people are even going to Afghanistan now, people are moving, just anywhere. Let me move. Is that bad? Just let's move. I had the privilege and the honor of praying with some of our wonderful sisters last week Sunday. They was it on Sunday? They came to me. Some precious sisters, uh, not from our country, but from another country. They saw me after service. They like, Papa, please, I want you to pray for them. I'm like, where are you, where are you going to? I say, Papa, we're, we're going to America. Oh, I said, praise God. I said, are you flying with Delta or you are flying with Lufthansa? I said, no, 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 no Papa. That we are going first to South America. Uh -uh. I said, South America, well, what kind of flight are you using? He said, no, we're going to South America. From South America, we're now going to fly to one island. From that island, we're now going to, Papa, that's why I want you to pray. That will not end up inside the sea or in the bush. <laughs> Look at, and I said, really? This is what you want to do? He said, sir, we are many. So the two of them that sat with me, this one said, Pastor, I came, I met this one. She said, the agent taking me is different from our agent. I said, Ma, but they rape a lot of you, they kill a lot of you on the road between Mexico and America. And I said, America is tightening their border, you are going. She said, Daddy, that's why I want you to pray. You see the job we are into? That's why I want you to pray. People are running. Question, did God say you should move? No. Doesn't it make sense to move? No, talk to me with the condition on ground. Doesn't it make sense? It makes sense. It makes sense. And they decided to move. The same thing happened in the time of Isaac. Whatever was the prevailing conditions, we don't know the details, but it was famine. And the guy decided to run. Packed his wife and said, sweetheart, we're moving. And as they were moving, 
somewhere around the border. You know, the lady says something to me. She says, I said, so um, are you going to fly? What kind of airline will you fly to South America? She said, no, sir. That there's a private jet already that has come from South Africa. I say, eh? I said, this is a sophisticated thing. You know? She says, sir, that's a private, in fact, the private jet could not contain all of us. That's why we didn't leave yesterday. We are there flying to South America, from South America, drop them in an island now. You, you either swim like shark into, an, into <laughs> So I want you to think about this. We don't know where God spoke to Isaac. We're not sure whether it was inside the house. But I want you to assume two different scenario, scenarios. Whereby, one, he had packed his things and they were about to get out of the house and God said, where are you going to? And God said, stay here. Imagine a case whereby he has left the house. He was at the, at the airport and here was the plane ready to take off British Airways. He has even taken picture. He has sent it on WhatsApp. Guys, peeps, Can I ask you a question? If you hear stop at the airport, will you come back? Re, eh, who said yes? Re, <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> Obedience test. If, you, if God says stop at the airport, if you will stop, raise your hand. So, so calm down. God is watching you because you may go through the test. I said, you are inside the plane, seated, and the next thing you heard, come down and go back home. Demand for your bags. Raise your hand if you will obey. Ah, Father, look at this too. <laughs> okay, so can I tell you this? As big as that may look, haven't we found ourselves in situations whereby we're moving into it and God says stop, but we had no brakes. The place goes quiet now. Sister, when you were entering the car, were you not hearing Gagan? Oh yeah. Give me a correct movie, something there. Sister. <laughs> <laughs> Sister, why you were raising your leg? <laughs> were you not hearing the next leg? Huh? Tell me you were not hearing it. Is there any drum effect also going with it? Because I really need that thing. You were telling me you're not hearing it. When he was sitting inside now, and you went and sat down. Didn't you hear? It was there. When you were going inside the house, were you not hearing? <laughs> eh? When he put on the TV, Funny part is that when the TV came out, the first thing you had was get out. You know. They put on the TV. You were hearing and now repent. Wasn't God warning you? You heard the voice inside. God, you situation around you outside. But like a sheep led to the shearer. When you were going to sign the contract, were you not hearing Gaga? When you were going to sign up and invest money into that thing, were you not hearing? But you were hearing in six months' time. In six months' time. In six months. Be, here, be playing Gaga. God is saying, My son, my son. But you were, somebody will say, Oh, God, in six months. Oh, God, in six months. God is Gaga, you are six months. <laughs> if you understand what I'm saying, wave your hands at me. God forgive you. Wave your hand properly. 
Show God you, you understand what I'm talking about. Eh? When do I tell you, madam, madam, do you have other money? Add more. MMM. Eh? MMM. You, they were, madam, in six months, eh? Your life will change. <laughs> God keeps warning. Eh? When that person started becoming close to your family, and you're like, oh my God, she's such a nice friend. Um, uh, your husband, you know, she's such a, she's a colleague in the office. Ah, and your wife was hearing. <laughs> I, and your wife was like, sweetheart, <laughs> this woman, eh? ah, no, I'm by yours. You are like, no, no, no. She's just a colleague in the office. And your wife was, <laughs> you are gaga. God is speaking. I had the same experience. Lady entered, she has entered our house. She has entered our house very close to my wife until one day in a vision. Gaga. I was having a vision and I saw the person in a vision standing on an altar. Normally in a wedding, in a wedding scenario, you are supposed to have the man on the altar waiting for the woman. In this case, it was a woman with her cheap bridesmaid waiting on the altar. <laughs> so I was looking in the spirit as if I was in a balcony, on a balcony. And I was looking, I'm like, ah, what is going on here? Then the priest walked up to the lady and said to her, young lady, where is the man? She said, I don't know why he's not here yet. Too. Is he not Reverend Sam? Hey! I'm telling you this under God. I came out of that vision and I'm like, what? My heart was panting. I said, God, what is this? And the Lord says, son, patterns are about to repeat themselves. I said, Lord, what pattern? He said, remember, my, mo my wife's mother, a woman had a challenge with her own husband. My wife's mother was generous. She said, ah, Mama Agnes, very nice woman. Very liberal. She can give you anything. That's how Mama welcomed her friend into her house. And the friend took over her husband. And Mama, who is not, she's a peacemaker. Mama carried her legs and walked out of the house. My wife was five years old. My wife was looking at her mom and saying, Mama, Mama, you know go stay because of us. The mother turned back and looked and walked away. That's how the mother and the father never saw each other until the father died. The other woman became the wife who is currently the wife. Even though Baba has gone. Here's a lesson. When that incident happened, my wife is a friendly person but very careful about who she calls a friend. For me to now see this person uh, uh, coming into our house regularly, I say, what has happened to my wife? Then I had this vision. I said, God, what is this? And the Lord said to me, patterns are about to repeat themselves. Say, your wife is opening up to someone that can cause a damage in the family. Stop the person. And I called my wife. I said, from today. No reason. But this person will not enter this house Hey, but Reverend Sam, you are Pastor Sam. You are powerful. Really? The secret of powerfulness is distance. May you have understanding later. Is that okay? <laughs> the secret of power. You want to be powerful? Eh? From what? You will know how powerful a man can be when he sleeps on the lap of a woman. You know something? How powerful? Proximity is what kills powerful men. So you were hearing the voice. Stop. And God said to Isaac, Stop. And Isaac, the wings of obedience. Let me ask you a question. When God says, Don't go to where there's money. Don't go to Canada. Don't go to UK. When God said, Don't go. Did God wanted to punish Isaac? So you can see that punishment was not what was in his mind. And I said something. You will never see the blessing until you get to the other side of what? Obedience. 
And the guy said, since God said, stop, we are not going. Sweetheart, hello, immigration officer, please, can I have my passport back? We are not traveling anymore. Ah, uh -uh, are you normal? I am very normal. And then imagine people see you back home. Did the, was the flight canceled? No, we are not going again. Why? God said we should not go. You are not normal. Don't worry about whether I'm normal or not. Give me 12 months. At the end of the year, we will see whether I am normal or not. In 12 months time, the Bible said that same year, God so blessed him that the nation began to envy him. I'm talking about obedience. I'm talking about obedience. Obedience increases the operation of God's grace in your life. If obedience increases the operation of God's grace. Every time you are asking God for a miracle, God will respond by giving you an instruction. Every time you are trusting God for a miracle, God, I want you to do this miracle in my life. How many of you are believing God for financial miracles here? Can I tell you how to get it? Instruction. So it, you want this financial miracle, just simply say, God, what do you want me to do? Simple. What do you want me to do? What do you want me to give? What do you want me to sow? Instruction. Where do you want me to go? What do you want me to start? Where do you want me to stop? The obedience, the blessing, the miracle you're looking for is on the other side of an instruction. When obeyed. Divine instruction opens the door for limitless possibilities. Divine instruction opens the door for limitless possibilities. It opens the door for the entrance of favor and honor. When God gives you an instruction and you obey that instruction, it opens the door for honor and favor. Try it this year and see how God will begin to honor you in no small way at all. Are there negative effects of disobedience? Ask the family of Adam. The Bible said God spoke to Adam and said to him, you shall not eat of any of, of this particular fruit of the tree in the garden. And that particular one, wait a minute, God said it's everything but there's this one. Let me say this, God always have this one he will not want you to touch. Have everything, enjoy everything but there's this one, stay away from it. And the exact one God says stay away from was the one Adam. Isn't it funny to know he didn't test other trees but it was the one God says stay away from that Adam moved towards. What was the consequence of that disobedience? That singular act of disobedience opened the door for pain for many generations to come. The same thing with the family of Achan in Joshua chapter 7. They entered into the promised land. And as they entered into the promised land, they had conquered Jericho. And when they conquered Jericho, listen, God said to them, as you conquer Jericho, don't take anything out of Jericho. Why? Why? Jericho was the first city on the other side of the Jordan to be conquered. Is that correct? And by principle, the first of all things belongs to who? It belongs to God. So God said, listen, this is the first. Don't touch this one. I still have more cities to give you. Do you want to stop at the point of disobedience? I will give you more. But I want to test you with the first. And the Bible says that Achan will not have any of that. Everybody obeyed. Everybody. People literally walk out of Jericho. People saw gold. They saw diamonds. People saw all manner of things in the land. People saw money. And everybody just said, no, it belongs to God. The first belongs to God. The first belongs to God. Everybody walked away. Some saw, they saw bundles of dollars. Anybody understand what I'm saying here now? May I ask you? If you see... If you see $60,000 now on the ground, I mean like you were just walking and it, you saw it on the ground. And we have just declared here, strange favor coming your way. 
Will you take it? God, God forgive. I mean, God have mercy on you. I mean, that you are sincere. God have mercy on you. Hello, sir. They saw it. They saw, they saw money. They saw gold. They saw diamond. They saw platinum. They saw everywhere. Ah, man. And the temptation was strong to carry it. But they kept saying to themselves, no, this is a what? I'm not hearing you. This is a what? This is a first. It belongs to God. This is a first. It belongs to God. This is the first. It belongs to God. To God, or not the Lord with your substance and with the first of all your increase. All this is the first, it belongs to God. And they said, No, 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 no. We need it, but we're not going to take it. We need it, but we're not going to have it. Yes, we will need to use it, but we're not going to take it. It is the first. Everybody moved. And uh, Akan was passing by. See, you, you know, you know how blinded you can become when you keep your eyes on human beings. Then you forget there's God who sees. And as Achan looked around, thank you guys. Achan looked around. See, if you grew up, <laughs> if you grew up where some of us grew, do, do you know what it means to move your hands and things will follow it with nobody knowing? That things have followed you. <laughs> you shift it, right? So, so imagine that everybody was moving, and Akan saw this thing here, and everybody was saying, "It is the first Akan. Nobody touches this. It is the first. God has so much in store for us. This is just a test of obedience. Is God going to come and use these things?" No. Is he trying to punish us? No. He just wants to check, can you honor my words, my instructions? That's just all. And the Bible says, he can just look at it. And uh, while everybody was looking, hallelujah. And, and you know, amen, Father, we worship you, I worship you. Lord. So he worshiped with them like that. He carried it. He carried the first. And let me tell you what he did past Sunday. He took the first into his house. He never knew he was setting himself for a major warfare with the God who lays claim on the first. And he carried it. The Bible says he went and dug a place in his house. Am I correct? And he did away from the God he thought sees like men. And so, Israel, nobody knew. I'm showing you why many families have gone through many tragedies. Why many are not blessed. And then Israel, please, I watch this. After the victory, everybody was excited. Everything was okay. Jericho has been conquered. Then the next thing that happened was that they now had to go and conquer Ai. As they moved towards Ai, in fact, Ai was a place that Joshua, when it was time to prepare for Ai, Joshua did not even pray. No, instruct, no need to wait on God because it was a small city riding on the wave of sudden victory. The Bible says, and Achan just selected some men Say, so you guys go. This one is a small one. And for the first time, the Bible says Israel turned their backs on their enemies. They were killed. Ah! Joshua went on his face before God. He wept. Ah! God, why will we go through this? Because of the genuinity of his heart. God said, I will tell you why. He said, son, there's an Achan in the camp. A what? He said, God, what does that mean? He says, somebody, listen to what God calls the first two. He says, somebody has carried the accursed thing. Meaning that first, there's a curse on it. Don't carry it. He says, somebody has no word, man. Carried the accursed thing into the person's camp. The implication is that the person will not leave. Find a person 
I'm a merciful God. I have been merciful to the nation in their error. Israel sinned against God in the wilderness. I forgive them. Outright wickedness, I forgive them. He said, but this one is an accursed. He said, bring the person, he has to die. Not just him. The family members who saw it and said nothing about it. That's how an entire family was wiped out. And the Bible says the plague over the land stayed. God had mercy over them. And then after that, victories began. My, my, my question, sir, you know, Pentecostal church, we are used to, I don't know why God keeps pushing me to you, sweetheart. The Lord said I should tell you that you've seen defeat enough. You will not see defeat again. In the name of Jesus Christ. The Spirit of the Lord said I should tell you from this moment, the moments of pain and defeat you've seen before, you will not see again. The Lord said it's a new season in your life. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Thank you. Please, ma'am, can I see you? The madam. Yes, ma'am. Yes, can you come, please, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. Yes, come. Yes. I don't know why the Lord wants me to just touch your hands. I see you are someone with a large heart. You seem to have a lot of people that are depending on you. You help a lot of people. Is that correct about you? Fantastic. The Lord said, I'm going to increase that which I'm putting in your hands in terms of resources. And the Lord said, from this moment, say at the spirit of a living God, I will increase the pool of resource in your hands. And this time around, the Lord said, I will begin to cause you to help as many as your heart desires. I'm enlarging your coast. You've been wondering, you say, where are the people that I've helped in the past? The Lord said, take your eyes away from those that you have helped. Because the ones that will come to sustain and uphold you are coming from a place you never know. I am stirring the heart of many to come and help you see the spirit of a living God. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Glory be to God. So my question to you, everyone watching me right now, my question to you is, what, what is, what is God saying, don't touch? The blessing is in the obedience. What is God saying, start? Father, this is my year, my year of uh, great grace. For what? What is God saying, start? I'm asking you a question. What is God saying, start? Who am I talking to? What is God saying, start? I'm talking to someone who dilly-dallies a lot. You procrastinate a lot. Start. Start. Sorry, sir, grace is upon you. The Lord said, I should tell you that which is on your heart, do it. The Lord said, I should tell you that which is on your heart, the time has come, do it. And I hear the Lord say, give your all to it. The Lord said, I should tell you that give away the excuse of the possibility of failure. The Lord said, don't be afraid that you will fail. The Lord said, I have it all figured out for you. The Lord said, I have it all figured out for you. The Lord said, what you are afraid of will not happen. The Lord said, go into the deep. Go into the deep. In fact, the Lord said, do it bigger and better than you had intended to. For grace is upon you for that. In the season. What is, what is God telling you to start? And secondly, what is God telling you to stop? What is God telling you to what? Stop. Stop. There's someone under the sound of my voice and the spirit of the Lord is saying, I should tell you, you have come into the most significant season of your life. And the Lord said, I want to lift you up. I want to bless you like never before, but I'm asking you to stop. And he said, you know what I'm telling you to stop. The Lord said, it's time to do what? Stop it. Stop it. You are your own obstacle. I hear the Lord said, I want to bless you, but the time has come for you to do what, sir? Stop it. W whatever that means to you, but you know I'm speaking to your heart. Stop it. And 
there's somebody watching me here. The Lord is saying, I should tell you, what I'm telling you to stop, it's not even what people see. People don't even see you when you do it. People don't see you when you're involved in it. It's so hidden, it's so private, but the Lord said, stop. You know, I'm hearing something very strong here. Somebody has started, but the Lord said you are not giving your best to it. The Lord said it's time to deploy your best around it. The Lord said you are giving mediocre attention to this and that's why you're having mediocre results. You are giving mediocre attention to it. The Lord said that's why you're having mediocre results. You have not yet given your hundred to it. I don't know who you are, but the Spirit of the Lord is saying to me, your maximum results will come when you start giving your maximum impute. Start giving it your best. Start giving it your what? Your very best. I don't know what it is. 